I want to give a little bit of background on some interesting theories on the origins of the human mind and the origins of human societies and their relationship with psychopathology. Uh, so what I propose to do today is uh, present in three or four different ways, uh, depending on whether or not I have time, uh, what I like to call a brief history of, of human fragility. So I wanna examine the history of Homo sapiens from the perspective of our fragility, which as I'm gonna go on to argue and to explain is at once our greatest strength, but also our greatest risk, or perhaps the source of most of our, again, of our strength, but of our distress uh, and of our violence and of a lot of social conflict. Um, so these are some of the influences um, that I don't have much time to get into. Uh, some of these books we review in a lot of depth in my cognitive anthropology class, uh, but these are all interesting interdisciplinary scholars who are interested in, in different ways in the co-evolution of mind and culture and who have uh, in very significant ways complexified, uh, enriched, and also challenged some of the early uh, rather simplistic accounts of, uh, of human evolution, in particular, the first wave of evolutionary psychology. Some of you may or may not know this, evolutionary psychology gets a lot of bad press in the social sciences, even increasingly in the clinical sciences. It's not uncommon that we hear that evolutionary psychology is racist or it's sexist or it's, uh, it, it's you know, Nazi. There's, there's been all these interesting, partially founded, partially unfounded accusations of evolutionary psychology uh, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which that I've mentioned already being that the burden of proof is quite low. You know, we're not able to build time machines and to observe longitudinally how humans evolve. So there are the just so stories. And there's all kinds of anxieties about the so-called normative fallacy that if we find that on average, uh, some traits might be innate and evolved. Some people might be inclined to argue then, therefore things ought to be that way, which uh, is uh, from my perspective, not the point of a lot of evolutionary psychology, but evolutionary psychology tends to elicit controversy, fears and anxiety uh, because of its emphasis on sexual dimorphism, for example, because of its emphasis on at least posited evolved differences between men and women, and because of its emphasis on reproductive fitness as one of the primary mechanisms driving everything that humans do. So reproductive fitness, meaning uh, trying to reproduce, trying to have sex, trying to have partners, trying to uh, obtain and raise viable offspring. So that was deemed quite reductionistic for, uh, for many people. And there was always a risk that it could be read through something of a sexist lens. Um, so all these authors that I draw on um, in my own work on cognitive evolution, but also in my own teaching come uh, from later waves of evolutionary theory that are much more complex, much more nuanced, that uh, attempt to address some of these criticisms. And in particular, that have attempted to show how reproductive fitness may not be the be all and end all of the human species. Uh, so I'm going to get there in a moment, but there's been a, an interesting debate that sometimes elicit controversy, sometimes not, on the extent to which uh, humans might be eusocial. So eusociality is a construct in sociobiology, and in evolutionary biology refers to species that put group fitness ahead of individual fitness. So ants, bees uh, are eusocial, uh, naked mole rats are, as far as we know, the only mammals that are eusocial. And you, and you social species have, for example, sterile castes. They have castes or groups of individuals who do not reproduce, but who serve another function for the purpose of, for the benefit of the group. So the, the idea is that you social species, again, will, individuals will very often sacrifice themselves for the purpose of uh, the survival of the group. And there are anthropologists, and I, and I am one of them, full disclosure, who thinks that humans, um, may not completely be eusocial, but we definitely tend towards uh, eusociality. Um, okay, so I wanna present the, the thesis of my book, um, which is also one particular spin on, on human evolution. So, 
Uh, if at some point you read some of the books from my cognitive anthropology class, like for example, The Secret of Our Success by the evolutionary anthropologist, Joe Henrik, who heads the human evolutionary biology lab at Harvard, he says, well, the, this, the secret of human success is uh, collective intelligence. Humans, individuals are not particularly smart. In fact, chimpanzees have been shown uh, to be, to outperform humans at simple working memory tasks or individual problem solving. Uh, the only things that makes humans smart is uh, cooperation and the fact that we require a lot of help from a group and that we draw our intelligence, not from the individual ability to figure things out in the environment, but from a cumulative cultural repertoire, a repertoire of skills, of goals, of stories, of myths, of institutions that is elaborated, uh, passed on and improved upon from generation to generation. So Joe Henrik is a wonderful book with tons of historical and ethnographic case studies showing how Again, without all the solutions that we can download from the cultural packages that we are socialized into or that we ourselves recruit ourselves into, we are not smart at all. So Joe Henrik is, although he does not mention it in those terms, he also paints somewhat of a eusocial picture of the human species where it's always the group um, that provides the solutions for the, for the humans. My thesis is that the most important trait of Homo sapiens is our fragility, our, phys our physical weakness. As we're going to see, there's all kinds of spins that we can put on this theory or this hypothesis or this claim or this observation, depending on what you want to call it. One of which might be later, you know, when I like to start with like a counterintuitive punchline, I'll say, you know, for Homo sapiens, the tyranny of the weak has always been one of our worst problems. Not a problem per se, because it's bad to take care of others. We're gonna see that's, that's the only reason why we are alive as a species, but it may be that the worst forms of tyrannies throughout history have been predicated upon some defense of weakness rather than just sheer chimpanzee style bullying, which we still have in our genes. We still have uh, in some of our institutions, but actually, um, we're very, very different from our ape ancestors in terms of our relationship to fragility. So I've always, I've already mentioned that we call the lecture on uh, life history and evolutionary trade-offs. So we traded off a lot of muscle mass, some of our physical size and our physical strength, uh, our ability to, for example, you know, survive in the wild without clothes. Um, we traded that off for cooperation for bigger brains, but also for physical weakness. So the fact that Homo sapiens, uh, a rather frail naked apes in the span of a few hundred thousand years became the absolute worst super predator that the planet has ever seen is, is quite puzzling. And it's quite puzzling that we were able to do that not by becoming stronger, not by becoming super apes like King Kong, but by becoming weak apes. So that's, there's something very interesting there. So the claim I wanna explore is that our physical, but also our existential fragility, and I'm, I'll provide more examples, but what I mean by that, it's again, at once our greatest strength, our source of flourishing, but also the roots of most conflict and violence. And by conflict, I take a scaffolded approach started from starting from the individual. So intrapsychic conflict is the conflict inside myself. So I don't know, am I monogamous or polygamous? Am I happy or unhappy? Do I feel guilty or do I feel rage or do I feel pride? So there's a lot of internal conflict. Also interpersonal conflict. So sibling rivalry, um, you could say domestic violence, uh, intra-group conflict. So this is, uh, you know, people fighting within a class or within uh, a particular society, like what we're seeing right now with the, you know, vax, anti-vax, truckers, not truckers, and intergroup conflict. So it's another way to build on this very, uh, I think, productive metaphor that Plato offered us when he said, society is man writ large. It's this idea that we have, um, externalized and extended some internal capacities in that we have produced modes of interactions 
and institutions that reflect the structure of our consciousness and in evolutionary terms, the evolved structures of our mind um, and even nervous system. So again, this trade-off, we became weaker. Um, we have, remember, by far the longest childhood and slowest physical maturation process of any mammal and any great ape species. Remember that uh, unlike, say, cats or, or dogs or giraffes or goats uh, that tend to produce you know, lots of offspring at a time, so five or six, you know, they're quite cheap, quite cheap offspring. Gestating and raising a human baby demands an enormous investment, an enormous caloric investment, an enormous cognitive investment, an enormous interpersonal, social, economic um, investment, an enormous existential investment. And that human children require help from the group for absolutely everything, including rediscovering how to um, manage their instinct. So we have to relearn how to walk and we have to learn how to walk in uh, culturally specific uh, gender as in the social role specific ways. So that was one of the foundational insights of uh, anthropology. An essay that some of you might have encountered by Marcel Moss, who was an early anthropological theorist in his essay, Techniques of the Body. And he noted that uh, there were culturally specific ways of doing everything, eating and sleeping and suffering walking, um, Marcel Moss noted that it was a weird sign of perhaps the inferiority of Western cultures that Western people no longer knew how to squat. You know how if you, if you travel east from Europe, you know, starting in the Balkans and then going through the Middle East and through Asia, you find adult people who can who still squat, you know, drinking coffee and smoking, and they find it comfortable. Most Western people can't do that after the age of three or four. But, but all this to say that Everything that we do down to the way we use our bodies, and we're going to keep seeing this this semester, this semester down to the way we suffer, down to the way we you know, of being well and unwell is culturally learned. So we traded up the strength for, for these, these large brains that require imprinting from cultural scripts and tons of help from others. And this made us weak, physically weak, but so much stronger in other ways. So this I'm really not going to get into very much today. This is really the topic of my cognitive anthropology class. But uh, as far as behavioral science hypothesizes nowadays, the one minimal cognitive requirement for culture and cooperation on such a large scale is what we call theory of mind or perspective taking or joint intentionality. Uh, there's lots of synonyms to refer to this ability that humans have to put themselves in other people's perspectives to understand that other people also understand things, to also understand that other people have what we call in the philosophy of mind propositional attitudes. They have silent propositional attitudes. They state things that may be true or false in relation to their intentions. So in order to be able to be a cooperative human being and to engage in any kind of ritual from, I don't know, waiting in line at the supermarket or uh, I'm not sure, or going to school, we need to infer that other people also infer the same thing. So I expect that other people also expect that you know we should all abide by the same kinds of standards. So in other words, this is the cognitive requirement for social learning. There's, there are big, big debates in developmental psychology and the philosophy of mind about the extent to which theory of mind requires explicit content. For example, do we all have to have a script in our mind knowing that other people also have minds and that they have desires that they may or may not state? But so some people claim that this is a little too Eurocentric a theory. Um, but suffice it to say that imagine a scenario such that like a child, uh, a pre-linguistic infant wondering if his mommy is coming back to pick him up. Something like, Hmm, I wonder if mommy remembers that I exist. So this is an extraordinarily complex cognitive operation that requires putting yourself, in a sense, learning to see the world through the perspective of your expectations of another person. We know that 
if you go far in the autistic spectrum, this ability is impaired, um, which partially explains why people who are high in the ASD spectrum um, have difficulty picking up on certain social cues or they make gaffes and, and uh, errors in abiding by social conventions because, or so the story goes, there's this theory of mind mechanism that is impaired. So there are debates still, of course, about what exactly this mechanism entails, how early in development it arises. Right now, we have Professor Chris Onishi here at McGill, who is one of the grand guru of theory of mind research. She was able to demonstrate uh, in 2007 that 15 months old infants understand propositional attitudes, they understand false beliefs, they understand uh, other humans. Later, they were able to uh, downgrade that to seven months. So right now, this is where we're at. And there's also tons of theories about how this mechanism and how and when this mechanism evolved. So first wave evolutionary psychology, the one that is usually, you know, taxed of being, you know, sexist and, and racist, even, even though it's, it's not. Uh, um, the so-called Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis was one of the favored ones. So this is this idea that um, humans cooperate um, and we all need to do our share of the work to reap collective benefits. We reap more benefits from working together, but there's going to be people who figure out that they can just not really do much and still reap benefits. So this is the free rider problem or the freeloader problem in the philosophy of mind. So there's an idea that freeloaders had to be really good at understanding other minds to be really good at deceiving others, but then cheater detectors had to be good at detecting liars. And there was this cognitive arms race between cheaters and cheater detectors that gradually made us smarter such that the people with the, the best uh, mind reading genes uh, were selected for reproduced and, and passed on. So that, that, was, that was the first uh, posited account of the evolution of theory of mind. Many people don't like that account um, because it presupposes this sort of inherent selfishness, which is not really in line with what we have learned since about just how freely cooperative we are, how actually not that self-interested we are. So I'll review some of that evidence later. But suffice it to say that Machiavellian intelligence does exist. Machiavellian people do exist. There are hypotheses that the so-called dark triad of uh, you know, psychopathy, uh, sociopathy, and, and narcissism may be people who are just higher in Machiavellianism. We know that uh, chimpanzees are more Machiavellian than humans, that they're sometimes able to demonstrate an understanding of all their, their conspecific needs, but they're typically motivated to exploit those for the purpose of deception rather than cooperation. But a much more interesting account proposed by uh, Sarah Hurdy in her book, Mothers and Others. So Sarah Hurdy is, is a great, uh, I guess at some point, some people called her uh, a feminist primatologist simply because as a woman, also as a mother, she had different research interests. So rather than being interested in just warfare and selfishness, she was interested in child rearing and in cooperation. So she did a lot of work with uh, different monkeys and ape species and then different uh, hunter-gatherer. Um, I was gonna say something awful. I was gonna say hunter-gatherer species. I'm glad I did not say it. Um, and then hunter-gatherer tribes. And she proposed a much different account um, based partly on uh, her having solved, in my view, a very interesting evolutionary puzzle, which from a, an old school macho evolutionary psychology perspective was strange. And the puzzle was menopause. So menopause appeared to be, appeared to um, offer something of a challenge to the first wave, everything is about reproductive fitness, Darwinist reductionist series, because the idea was, well, so human females are uh, reproductively fit until about 45, 50, but many of them stay alive for another 30, 40, sometimes 50 years, even though from a Darwinian perspective, they're useless. Now, this was a rather reductionistic you know, understanding, one which did not take culture into account, one which did not take caregiving into account. So just looking at the ethnographic record uh, of the importance of grandmothers and great aunts and the importance of, of women in passing on key cultural knowledge, for example, 
about plants, about food productions, about health, uh, about healthcare, about medicinal things, but also about child, about child rearing. So it's later been found that the presence of grandmothers uh, and maternal grandmothers in particular is very protective and tends to correlate with higher nutritional status, lower mortality status in children. So the idea was like, yes, of course, our biology evolved increasingly to support cultural learning, to support social learning. So whether or not someone is individually reproductively fit matters little. What matters more is what, what can someone contribute to the group. Now, because recall, human culture is cumulative. So it iterates, it expands, it is expanded upon and improved from generation to generation, but also within one generation, it takes a long time to acquire the necessary skills and knowledges and attitudes uh, to be able to care for others. So Sarah Hurdy proposed that mutual caregiving rather than uh, Machiavellian intelligence was likely the, the mechanism that gradually, but quite quickly, allowed for the evolution of better perspective taking, better mind reading, better joint intentionality, whatever you want to call it. And she pushes this evolutionary moment as far back as the Homo erectus species, so about 2 million years ago. So those are proto-humans, uh, proto-sapiens, who looked uh, a little more ape-like. Um, and it is in the Homo erectus lineage that we have uh, skeletal evidence of uh, postmenopausal females, or I don't know if they were women in those days. I'm not sure the kinds of gender roles that were verbalized um, and, and ritualized. So while the first wave evolutionary theorists recall said, okay, what we need to be an intel a socially intelligent species is an ability to understand that other people can lie, and be able to detect lies or being able to, uh, yeah, lie and detect lies. Sir Hurdy says, no, yes, sure that happens, but by far the two, most important traits are the ability to give care and to elicit care. In order to give care, you need to be able to understand that other people have needs. So Sarah Hurdy calls this emotional modernity. There is, a, there is also a debate that I mentioned briefly about when and how we became behaviorally modern homo sapiens. So behavioral modernity means uh, we're already anatomically modern. We look like, uh, present day homo sapiens, and there is evidence of symbolic activity, of ritual, of culture, of language. So this we push back to about 150,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 years ago. Sarah Hurdy said, we first became emotionally modern, then we became anatomically modern, then we became behaviorally modern. So by emotional modernity, she means we are able to understand each other's needs, to understand each other's feelings, to understand each other's affects. And we are intrinsically motivated to act, to care for one another. So again, on this view, to survive, we need to be good at understanding, you know, we need to do our bit and, and help, but we also need to elicit care. So Sarah Hurdy in her wonderful book has lots of uh, fun facts uh, about the sort of the cuteness traps devised by evolution, you know, why we like round faces and why, you know, we find pictures of puppies and pictures of people with, uh, or beings with round faces and round eyes cute. We are wired to detect things that we find cute and we are motivated, you know, through hormonal cocktails such as oxytocin or even prolactin uh, to hug and care. So Sarah Hurdy is interesting because she also points out that babies have agency. That in fact, babies have so much agency that a baby crying or a baby being cute will just stop and mobilize everyone's attention. In fact, if you were a humanologist from another planet trying to understand Homo sapiens, you might first develop a theory of, of power that is the exact opposite to the ones that we often teach in political science now, this idea of sort of top down and hegemony. You might think it's, you know, it's the little humans that have all the power because everything is organized around them. They, you know, they, they squeal and people stop and they, they take care of them. So 
there is nothing in a sense, and it's not yet a moral uh, statement, but there's nothing more tyrannical than a baby. As indeed, there's nothing more tyrannical often than a very sick person uh, who elicits the care of others. But that's, again, not a bad thing. When I talk to tyranny, I speak of uh, imbalances of power, where the needs and the desires of one person or a class of person will mobilize the actions of a broader class of people. So from this, we have evolved uh, an instinct, um, not just to elicit care and to give care, but also to elicit teaching, to elicit knowledge and to teach. So one, uh, one scholar that we look at quite a bit in my cognitive anthropology class is the developmental psychologist, Michael Thomas Sello who studies socialization and who studies the acquisition of culture over the course of development. And he does comparative work with humans, chimpanzees, and dogs. And uh, Thomas Seller was able to find in multiple very elegant experiments, something that, that ought to have been obvious, but that humans, regardless of culture, uh, and children in particular, and then adults, are intrinsically motivated to cooperate uh, in at least three different ways. So, we are intrinsically motivated to share information, services, and goods. So for example, there's cool experiments where uh, an adult walks in front of a 15 month old child and the child doesn't know the adult and the adult drops their wallet and the child will just pick it up and give it back to them. Which again, if we pause to reconstruct the cognitive machinery that is required to do something like that, it is quite remarkable. So a child pre-linguistically already has an idea, a mental model that the other person walking also has a propositional mental state, has a belief that she has a wallet in her pocket, a false belief that the wallet is still in her pocket while it's not there. And then the child having cognitively understood that the other person has a false belief, so understands that the other person has a mind, is also just freely motivated to give something to others. So that would be sharing goods. Sharing information is uh, when you tell someone, oh, how, are you new here? Sure, so this is where we sit, or oh, the cafeteria is over there. Um, and sharing services is, yeah, helping an old lady cross the street or just doing something for others. So these three basic forms of cooperation are the building block of speciality, the building block of culture. They're found everywhere. And they don't really need to be taught. So the specific content of how one ought to or not to share, yes, uh, varies from, from culture to culture and requires some explicit cultural learning, but this we're intuitively wired to pick up on. Another thing that we're wired to pick up on is social status. Because remember, we can't figure anything out on our own. We need to learn from others how to function, how to be, but even how to make sense of our own interoceptive signals. Something goes on in your body you don't even know if it's good or bad or normal until someone else tells you. So we have these very, very deeply ingrained evolved biases for hierarchical, um, the picking up of what we call epistemic salience. So epistemic means that which pertains to theory of knowledge. So there are things that the human mind preferentially attends to automatically. The color red, for example, it signals danger, it looks like fire, this is universal. So this is why the little uh, flashing light, red light on your Facebook messenger, it's very good. Uh, it's very, very good neuromarketing because boom, you automatically attend to it. So humans automatically attend to social status and uh, without social instruction, you go somewhere, you're able to tell uh, who's in the know-how, who's cool, who's sort of prestigious. Often age is a good proxy for status, so you're gonna look for elders and children are very good at that, but there's other things like even expertise. So a child is able to pick up on whether someone is skilled at doing something or not. Perhaps an ability to pick up on like complexities and patterns of movement. Um, so, and this is required because we need experienced learners. We need people who have um, useful, 
contextual local knowledge to pass that knowledge on to us. So we're very attentive to that kind of hierarchy. As a result, we've also developed this ability to be intrinsically motivated to give information to those that we assume are inferiors or subordinates to us. And this is not a moral story. This is not, oh, people below are worse or better. It's this idea that there is a social status that is also an epistemic status. Who has enough of the contextually relevant knowledge uh, that they can pass on to others? So notice how very easy it is once the epistemic gap is wide, someone who's obviously a novice, like say you're in your, the last year of your PhD and someone is there in their first year undergrad, you're not competing for anything. You're just kind of a superior, you freely give knowledge. But as a last year PhD student, you look up to the postdocs or to the young assistant professors who can give you the sort of knowledge that you need. So this is very important because it's also the beginning of a more fine-grained theory of power. One where it's not just power is bad and there are people on top and they do things to people who don't have agency. We can forget about agency for now and we can think about hierarchies of care, of knowledge and of responsibilities. So we are all intrinsically motivated to care for the little ones, but to seek care from people above us. What's very interesting is then you get into gradients of peer-to-peer -peer learning and of peer-to-peer -peer competition. In a this is important because in a moment, I'll talk about different social con configurations that elicit our human fragility more than others. Among equals, people who are at the same level in a hierarchy, say in an official institutional hierarchy of learning, like you're, both, you're all, say, year three Coxsai students at McGill, you are competing. So you compete for grades, you compete for jobs, you compete for the attention of your professors. Um, so this is a zone of sort of almost kind of maximal conflict. Usually, we compete with near equals as well. So if someone is just one step above in the hierarchy, um, this is someone you can look up to, you can imagine yourself being them, you perhaps want what they have. And similarly, if someone is just below you, they could just be catching up. So it's typically within those zones of peer-to-peer uh, -peer and, and near-peer zones that you have the most competition. But importantly, in a well-functioning hierarchy, natural hierarchy, you don't need to compete with your superiors. You don't just arrive first year university and think I'm going to be a James McGill professor of law tomorrow. I'm gonna take that guy's job. No, it's impossible. Typically it's not even imaginable. So you're not gonna feel threatened or that triggered, but people around you, yes. Because typically, at least in a, in a sort of a natural setting, you are competing for parental attention. You're competing for the care of others above you. So there's, all kinds of cool paradigms. Uh, the last one I'll mention is from uh, the social psychology and educational psychology of Lev Vygotsky, who was a Soviet era uh, psychologist, which is again interesting how the, this, the social and historical context of the Soviet Union was, I suppose, more interested already in cooperation uh, than say a more individualistic context of Western psychology at the time. So Vygotsky developed a theory of learning uh, based on these kinds of hierarchical transfers of knowledge, and he was interested in what he called the zone of proximal development. So this refers to an optimal gap in skill or in knowledge between someone, a learner, and someone who's just above them, someone who has mastered that skill, but a skill which the learner has most of what it takes to learn, but they still need the extra help of someone above them. So if any of you are into different kinds of sports or competitive sports, or even things like whatever, like skiing, rock climbing, you know, ice skating, sometimes if you go out with friends and you're always the best skier, you're not really progressing at all. So you're, you're, you're teaching your friends, you're, you look out for them, it's great. But the time that if you go then ski with a bunch of like, you know, competitive, like Olympic level skiers, you're also not progressing because it's just really discouraging and you try to follow them and you fall and you really badly hurt yourself. But if you have someone who's just above you, someone who actually has the guts to and will actually just take the big air, 
then you'll take the big air with them. And by the end of the season, you can maybe land a 360 on that big air. So again, these are zones of competition and we're gonna to return to that in a moment, but these are also zones of very interesting cooperation where we need this kind of hierarchy. We need this competitiveness um, and we need these optimal gaps. So returning to this idea that when, when you're not yet a competent, uh, a skilled human at functioning in any given context, mostly social context, say abiding by social norms and having the required knowledge, then you are still fragile. You're still fragile in the sense that you're not individually equipped to function well. You require more help from others. There comes a trade-off. The trade-off being that it's actually advantageous evolutionarily to be fragile. We have seen this. We have traded off our strength, you know, where we have these very cute blobs of babies that everybody wants to hug and smell and help. So the trade-off is delicate because being too skilled will often mean that you're not getting much help from others. People think, oh, you know, she's got it, she's fine. So there's always a risk and there probably always was a risk for humans to over signal your fragility a little bit so as to be the recipient of care. Most of sibling rivalry is about that. Most of sibling, sibling rivalry is, uh, is about competing for fragility status, competing for the status of like deserving parental care. It's like, no, no, no. I'm the one, this awful wrong thing was done to me. It's unfair. I need love, I need care, I need attention right now. The problem is that there's some amount of Machiavellianism that may be involved in that. And this is sometimes what I wish Sarah Hurdy would put as a spin on her theory is that yes, you have mutual caregiving, cooperative breeding, she calls it, but there's also Machiavellian cooperative breeding where you just learn to sque squeal a little louder. And we all know scenarios like this in the context of sibling rivalry where, you know, where you're, you know, you're just gonna tell your sister no or something, or you're gonna pinch her a little bit and she's just gonna scream, like really, really exaggerate the scream and like the parents come and say, what did you do again? Go to your room and say, oh, come here, sweetie. It's okay, I'll buy you an ice cream. So the sister is learning an important lesson. She's learning that if she over signals her fragility, she gets what she wants. And um, now overt Machiavellianism is again, quite rare. Um, even if we buy the idea that there exists a set of uh, personality traits that some people have more than others, it's, it's rare. What tends to happen a lot more is self-deception. There's also very interesting evolutionary literature on self-deception. So this idea that it is cognitively and behaviorally advantageous to lie to yourself so as to better lie to others. Because lying is actually quite cognitively demanding you have to be able to hold counterfactual beliefs in your mind at any given time. And you have to think, okay, so people think that I believe X, but I have to pretend that I believe Y and what do, it's just too much. It's really difficult, which is why thankfully most of us get really flustered and really embarrassed when we have to lie and uphold a lie because there's a, there's a huge cognitive and emotional load uh, that clouds our ability to use our scanned cognitive resources that could be quite fluid. So it's much better to self-deceive. Self-deception is again, not a simple moral thing that, oh, it, it's good or bad. Self-deception is also how a lot of learning works. It's also how we learn to become confident and get over imposter syndrome. Everybody has imposter syndrome, of course, because we graduate and gravitate towards these socially assigned roles that are mostly sort of, we all know they're socially constructed and false. And then we have to walk around and pretend that we're a professor, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty daunting to do that. So it's more advantageous to at some point, you know, fake it till you make it. And then you integrate new behavioral schemas and you forget. Now, one problem that I wanna draw attention to, yes, um, is, is that we might very often self deceive into thinking and acting as though we are more helpless and more vulnerable than we actually are or could have been but we keep doing it because we receive care and love. Yes, young man, you uh, have. I'm just asking, uh, so like, uh, it's over something, so to be more confident, you lie to yourself by telling yourself that you're 
calling yourself sex work or something? Is that what you're saying? Sure. Is that for sure? Or is it yeah, yeah, absolutely. With the location of, as you say, the Chinese and the, okay, I guess the, then you start to believe it. And then you believe it. Yeah, you fake it till you make it. And then, and then the ontological status of your confidence becomes like pretty nebulous and complex because, you know, what does it mean to be actually confident? It means just, I don't know, not investing any cognitive energy in doubting yourself in a situation. And then you learn to not doubt yourself and then you function better in that situation. So you're fine, you, you've become confident. Um, yes? What if you're too honest with yourself and you can't lie to yourself? But in being honest with yourself, you may not be honest with the full scope of temporality and possibilities of what you might be. So you might have a, you know, you might in your folk model of what reality is emphasize being over becoming, but forget that, you know, things always changed. So it's actually quite difficult to know, I mean, what is the truth? Like, you know, are you confident or not? And uh, pragmatically what, what matters the most. Uh, but for sure we have, which is advantageous, right? I mean, we, we have to be able to invest interoceptive energy to like doubting what goes on inside our body because we need to be able to detect mal malfunctions. So if we lose that ability, then we might just, you know, risk, you know, dying of whatever of infection. But we are for sure way too neurotic as a species and probably much more so in the present historical moment. So sometimes we bring things into being by virtue of, you know, thinking about them. Hence, you know, the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Because for sure, you know, the, the, the road to not being confident is worrying that you're not confident. Just like, you know, if you worry, you know, you're not gonna do well in a test or like your date is not gonna go well, it's probably not gonna go well. <laughs> but so the idea here is that there's a very, very complex trade-off to negotiate where we have to be vulnerable. We might like fake it a little bit, but there are moments and there are conditions where we might just self-deceive way too much into becoming vulnerable. Now, something, and I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, yeah, I'll get back to that, I think, by the end of the lecture. Is that I'm very indebted to the works of the early social theorist, Alexis de Tocqueville. Some of you might know him from political science or from sociology. Um, so Tocqueville studied several things. He studied emerging forms of democracy and participatory democracy in America, of which he was a fan. And he studied the changing social conditions that led gradually to the uh, revolution in France and to the overturning of the old feudal system. So Tocqueville is, um, at the time, he sat at the center of the French parliament. So this is where we get historically the distinction left, right, and center, like where did you sit? So he can left center. So he considered himself a central left person. He was obsessed with uh, um, tyrannies of all forms, um, but he was also, so he was in many ways an egalitarian. He was, as I said, uh, a big fan of the forms of participatory democracy that were emerging in America this uh, distributed consensus-based democracy. But he also noted that a very interesting trade-off, he didn't use that term, but that's really what he meant, arose with conditions of equality and what it did to people's expectations and to social relation. In a nutshell, he noted that equality was by far the most anxiety-inducing of all social configurations. For reasons that he was trying to make sense of, I guess we're still trying to make sense of that insight because for sure, in theory, it sounds that equality of opportunity is probably the only way we would normatively want to organize our societies. We, we don't wanna tell people, no, you can't become this or that. But Tocqueville wondered, and many people who are now associated with I guess the old liberal left, when you say I'm a classical liberal, you typically mean something like, you know, I'm an old center left person. Uh, but now increasingly, 
a lot of these classical liberals are associated with conservative positions. So this is just interesting uh, historically how these denominations arise. But often there's a worry that when we become equal, um, it's rather the equality, we're equal in our mediocrity, we're all sort of dragged down on some level. So that's, you know, that's, that's a perhaps not terribly interesting conservative insight. But something that is uh, empirically quite demonstrable, I think, is that with equality, envy increases because all of a sudden, the realm of possibilities and the realm of expectations becomes much more chaotic, much more entropic, much broader. And there's this idea that everybody can be anyone or anything most of the time. And often we don't actually formulate what we mean. We don't actually carve out narratively really in our head, the goals of what it means. So does it mean that, you know, again, I can become the king tomorrow or does it mean that um, I could have what my neighbor has? So, so certainly with equality, which is, which you can associate with both socialist forms of social organizations, but also capitalist forms of social organization where there's this philosophy of the individual pursuit of happiness, the individual pursuit of profit, in, in, in individual pursuit of material goals. There's all of a sudden many more expectations and there's much more envy and something else with the progressive mindset. So progress is, is again, one side of a trade-off that I keep mentioning, which is that uh, in order for any system, but in particular a living system and a social system to keep functioning, it needs to conserve historically and evolutionarily old strategies uh, for, for living well, for living the good life. But it needs to be adaptable to novel changes, to novel pressures in the environment. So in the second part of today's lecture, I'll, I'll provide more language and metaphors to make sense of that, to think about fragility in uh, systems theoretic terms in very different ways. But we can note now that ecologically, a system can be fragile if it's too conservative or if it's too progressive. So too conservative a system is so rigid, it cannot account for novel information, it cannot adapt, it breaks. Too progressive a system is constantly updating, but it is losing the old uh, conserved strategies. So a lot of its basic needs are not going to be met. Now, one final sentence, and I'll, and I'll take your comment. Once societies adopt a progressive mindset, which is uh, the hallmark of our societies, there is the adoption of a deficit-based understanding of the world around us. What can we fix? How could things be better? Which is, again, how the human species has changed and thrived and evolved. The human species is uh, more progressive, I would say, biologically than it is conservative in the sense that we, we have changed and we have adapted a lot and we have created novel constraints to which we have adapted and so on and so forth. But it is certainly historically novel, uh, beginning not exclusively, but you know, quite a lot with the enlightenment and post-enlightenment philosophies of, of Western Europe, that there's this idea of, um, of progress, this idea of change, and this idea of constantly examining everything that is not working, everything that is broken, everything that ought to be fixed. With this deficit view of the world, we also adopt a sort of a deficit view of the self. We call under egalitarian, also capitalist conditions, we typically have a deficit view of the self. We, have this very hedonic model of happiness where we require constantly this external stimulus that lies beyond the next hill. So the game in our societies is not so much keeping up with the Joneses, but it's often outdoing the, jo the Joneses or canceling the Joneses or wanting what the Joneses have. So with this comes a lot more anxiety. You, you had a question, sorry. Yeah. Um, could it not back to what you said about envy increasing with equality. Um, those that would have been envious before we got a quote-unquote society would not have had a voice before, but now do, so that's why we push that envy. You know, to envy, say, to covet thy neighbor's wife, 
requires, I, I believe, a cultural script in which the possibility of you getting your neighbor's wife is already there. Now, the neighbor's wife scenario might actually be a little bit more transculturally complex in the sense that, you know, because of reproductive fitness biases, we, we may always have struggled to abide by those kinds of social norms. But if you look at large scale, institutionally, historically constructed um, injunctions on where bodies are allowed to go, what they can touch and what they can do, this is extraordinarily scripted and you need to be able to imagine that you can do it. Now, it may sound horrible, but this is the question that Harriet Tubman, the, uh, the American, the African-American abolitionist woman said, you know, and when she noted, you know, I freed a thousand slaves, I could have freed 10,000 more if only they knew they were slaves. And it may sound awful to say this now, but there, there are moments in history where it was for sure not imaginable that your life could be different. Just like now, you may, you know, you may like your neighbor's house and you may, you may like their car, but it's not even fully imaginable for you to just march in your neighbor's house with the machine gun and say, just leave, I'm gonna take that house, right? Um, so the possibility of envy is also to a large extent encoded in what is already culturally imaginable to you. And this, this idea that most of what we perceive, dream, hope, has to be, has to exist in the environment of shared expectations and stories is something that is gonna become more obvious when we review, for example, culturally, cultural ways of being well and unwell. This idea that we also, we have very culturally specific ways of somatizing even, that happens uh, even at very unconscious levels. So there's archeological and hysterical evidence of very hierarchical social systems that just don't change for a very, very long time until novel information enters the system through perhaps invasion by another group or travel or you know, accident of some sort. But typically you need some kind of you know, cultural diffusion. Um, interestingly, the natural pedagogy system that I described about hierarchies of care and growth is one that was already accounted for, I would say, in Taoism and Confucianism, I would say, but without, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's not a statement about, you know, whether it's better or not, but I would say Confucianism is, is probably the, the ethical philosophy that has the most realistic uh, naturalistic understanding of how humans operate. That doesn't mean, again, it doesn't have to be a naturalistic fallacy. It doesn't mean we could do something else. So it is interesting um, that, and that's, that's one of my hypotheses that I'm still trying to flesh out. So I really wanna discuss this at, at greater length you know, with the class and, and with others. But it's possible that under the current conditions in particular of anomie, where we really have kind of radically reshuffled and in many ways annihilated the kind of cultural codes that people looked up to and lived by, where it is really increasingly up to the individual to reinvent everything. And you've heard me say this and you'll, you'll hear me say this again, this I strongly believe partially explains why so many of us are kind of losing the plot. Because the metaphor is a good one, there is no plot. You write your own plot, you are the author of your own story, which is always true, or which can be true, but the trade-off is with this comes an enormously high burden of anxiety and a very high burden of conflict as well. Because I firmly believe that if what we are told implicitly or explicitly is that we can be whatever we want to be and that you know only we decide, well, that's not mathematically possible in the sense that we're still a cooperative species and we, we still require help from others. There's only so much, in fact, there's only very little than we can do on our own. So we're still competing uh, for the one resource that humans need the most. We're competing for love and for recognition uh, and for care and we're competing for belonging, but often we, we do it without realizing that we are just competing for the integrity of one particular normative model of you know, how we ought to live our lives. 
what I find interesting is that in this, you know, many people have used, you know, rather moralizing terms to talk about, yeah, you know, snowflakes and, but increasingly it has become more obvious that people are competing for fragility. People are competing for recognition of suffering, for recognition of victimhood. And it seems to me that there's something quite primitive in the evolutionarily primitive sense where once we've gotten rid of most historically old institutional ways of living, which again, may not have been good, maybe we need to reinvent them. If we're left to reinvent the wheel from scratch, we're gonna go back to very primitive themes, which is let's protect the weak. Um, but also let's be weak. So we can be worthy of love and we can be worthy of protection. So de Tocqueville already, even though he didn't use that language, noted that there was in increasingly egalitarian progressivist societies, a lot of competitive victimhood. So um, competitive victimhood is um, a very, very central mechanism in intergroup conflict. I've, I've mentioned it a bit. Um, I think in response to a, a question that was posed by one of you last class, which is that if we examine historically um, the most atrocious acts of organized violence, they were typically motivated not really by uh, plunder, not really by exploitation, but by seeking retribution for perceived harm, very often historically real enough perceived harm. So this is again, one of those unresolved dialectic uh, that characterizes the human species, the yin, the yang, these contradictions, right? Remember, we don't know if we're polygamous or monogamous, if we're uh, nomadic or if we're settlers, and we don't know if we're Machiavellian or if we're caregivers, we're sort of both. So of course, throughout history, there have been many, many just you know, unspeakably atrocious acts of, of plunder and of theft um, and, of, and of exploitation um, and of slavery. But here I'm gonna say something that if it, if it triggers you, you need to ask me why and, and we need to talk about it. But slavery in a sense is already historically the beginning of a more caregiving um, retributive justice system. So long story short, most early primitive societies that do not yet practice slaveries take no prisoners. So there's lots of very interesting work on tribal warfare in small scale societies, um, but those societies that begin to take, uh, often forcibly, of course, members of other groups to integrate to their group, often do this under the idea that they at least have to provide something like safe food and shelter, as opposed to earlier instances where kill the men, abuse the women. So, where, where, was I, where was I going with this? The, um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. To say that we cannot dismiss historically the, the terrible vi dehumanizing violence that has been per perpetr perpetrated by the kinds of projects that under current language we would call colonialists. So one group is stronger than another group goes, takes the people, takes the resources, absolutely. But in each and every case, of conquest, there's a moment where the plunderers have to give something back. They have to provide something. They have to provide food, they have to provide shelter, they have to provide care more and more until this is the master-slave dialectic, if you will, in Marxist terms. There's this conflict throughout history that recurs between masters and slaves. The slaves rebel, they become masters. But in between, there's lots of gradations of the slave, the masters increasingly realizing that they have to give something back. And then the slaves, if you will, realizing that they're entitled to be cared for, which is what all humans are, are entitled to. But when you examine the actually genocidal uh, atrocities that have been committed, these are typically committed under the impression or under the desire of protecting alleged victims. So the 
post Versailles Treaty Germany, for example, there was increasingly a narrative of discontent, of, of being the underdog, of, of being made poor by unfair international economic policy, by unfair banking policy and international capital, et cetera. And, there, and then you, you get to a, a rather predictable, uh, frequently historically recurring conspiracy theory about sort of Jewish control. But the Nazis presented themselves as victims not as, oh, we're just evil and we want to just go exterminate people just because. Just like the, the Hutus historically had been victimized by the ruling, the Tutsi ruling class. And so it went in the Balkans and so it went with you know, the Soviet Union and Maoist China and so on and so forth. But it's interesting to see that and to, to revisit again, even episodes that begin in plunder, like for example, the history of ancient Rome, um, uh, a bunch of roaming bandits, you know, go and, and, and burn and rape their way through the countryside and eventually, you know, fund a city, you know, they, they kidnap women from uh, and abuse them from, an, uh, from another place. But then quickly they develop a social structure where the patricians, so the overlords, you know, have to give something back to the plebes. And then in each generation, and then there are emperors who sort of cave in and who become weak and who sort of give more. And that's been the history uh, of, 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 the human of the human species of always, in a sense, being predicated upon this, this always imperfect mutual caregiving dialectic. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Spoken about this. Uh -huh. Yes, go on. Um, my question is related to Amir Hindu. Go on. I wonder if, you, if there are any like overlaps between uh, Stealing's theory and the social revolutionary right? And I don't know. Really Whose theory, pardon me? Like capitalist theory of the institution? Capitalist theory. Yeah, yeah capitalist theory is, this is what's very interesting. Um, classical liberal theory, uh, which then articulates a theory of, of cooperation and a theory of human nature and a theory of the state is very optimistic. And it is on this idea that, that humans you know, naturally wanna pursue you know, happiness but that they're intrinsically motivated to share, hence this idea of this, this invisible hand uh, that some redistribution will, will occur. Um, of course, we know this to only be partially the case. So we, we, we do know, again, uh, we do know again that um, early industrialization and capitalization has extremely rough beginnings. Uh, so these are the conditions, say 19th century London, of the, the appalling condition, living conditions of the proletariat in which Marx was elaborating his theories. But that over generations, wealth is generated. It is shared to an extent. And then you get to actual diseases of progress where you, you know, people are more depressed, uh, more suicidal than, than homicidal. Um, socialist theory, whatever it is, is very pessimistic. It is much more related to, uh, you know, say Hobbes as opposed to Rousseau in, in classical Western political theory. There's this idea that, that humans will be selfish and they will exploit each other. And unless there is a strong intervention from above, um, collective happiness will not happen. Um, where is the truth? We don't know because I think we have enough evidence. We, we see that, uh, that both capitalist and socialist experiments have, have failed to some extent. Um, but perhaps one aspect of this theory that capitalist theory, whatever it is, would not account for is the importance of hierarchical transfer of skill and care and, and knowledge. So homofragilist theory um, would, I think, I mean, I haven't fully gotten there, would require a state for sure, would require benevolent social institutions that are in many ways parental figures that, that provide, but that also you know, teach enough autonomizing skills, autonomy supporting skills so that, you know, you don't just give people fish, you, you teach them how to fish. And, and perhaps capitalist theory, uh, very naive capitalist theory that, that assumes that there will not be hierarchies is perhaps wrong on a naturalistic account. Uh, 
This is why, for example, I maybe I'm just too old, like the whole crypto bro uh, blockchain thing. I mean, I guess maybe I've I've stopped learning. I've my I've, I've stopped updating my brain enough to comprehend what young what these people are into. But it strikes me as extraordinarily naive uh, in, in this idea. It strikes me as just capitalism by another name. Um, But let, let's go back again uh, before we take a break to this very, uh, well, it's a very, it's not, it's a very bad pleonasm, but this, uh, this very fragile trade-off of fragility, which is that we need to be fragile to receive care. We need to be vulnerable. We need to suffer. Um, and invariably, we have seen that most human traditions mythical traditions, religious traditions, to some extent, venerate suffering, to some extent, deify victimhood. Um, probably, again, because it's always good to enrich our innate genetic potential with stories that kind of reinforce and that teach just how important it is to care for others and to care for the weak. But just like there are individual differences and historical differences, there are social and cross-cultural differences in the extent to which different spiritual traditions elevate suffering as an end in itself, for example, or just mention suffering as something that needs to be alleviated. Uh, without wanting to simplify, um, Christianity is many, many things, uh, and, and even Catholic theological doctrine is basically just a set of complicated debates but perhaps more than many other, perhaps more than any other religions, I'm not sure, there has been a kind of an elevation of suffering as an end in itself down to the kinds of flagell flagellating rituals. Um, so there's, there's always that risk, um, it seems to me. So one, and here, uh, this is a much, much, much longer conversation about what, what's going on nowadays, but it is, possible on this account that the perversity of the fragility signaling trade-off is so that we don't just signal enough fragility to be loved and cared for, but we, we get trapped in, I suppose, cultural cycles where it is the fragility that is desirable as an end in itself, where in fact, we, we think we're asking for help, but what we're asking for is the confirmation of our suffering. And we devise a set of institutions, a set of narratives, a set of ways of interacting to constantly uh, perpetuate that suffering. So that's a much, much longer conversation that requires you know, some detours through you know, linguistics and hypnosis. And, um, and I can get there a, a little bit in, in the second part of the lecture. But in terms of, um, yeah, the very, very, very rough introduction to homo fragilis theory, this is, this is sort of what I, what I wanted to say. Um, so yeah, take, take something like um, the sort of transabled movement. So here I'm distinguishing this between say the invi in, in, uh, pardon me, invisible disability movement, which I think we, we, ought, we ought to explore under the lens of homo fragilis theory to an extent, but it also is the case that some people have uh, debilitating disabilities that are just not visible and that it is indubitably a form of progress, you know, to recognize those and to do something about it. But here I'm, I'm trying to understand, for example, the idea of transibility. So people who, as far as we know, do not initially or do not have a disability, um, but who identify as having a disability. There is also uh, the very, very interesting uh, Rachel Dolezal, you know, Jessica Krug, and all the so-called identity hoaxers. There was a wonderful article in The Atlantic on this. So remember Rachel Dolezal, right? She was uh, the head of the NAACP in, in the US. Um, but it later emerged, you know, she was uh, doxxed, I suppose you could call it, that she was not a real woman of color. She was actually white. But 
evidence, if we can speak of evidence, suggests that you know she had been in this role for so long that she herself was probably convinced that she was a person of color. So, and so there's lots of cases like these. And this is what, this is what people like uh, the psychologist Jonathan Haidt, the sociologist Jason Manning, you know, and many, many others, they spoke in, they, they speak of victimhood cultures, right? So there are cultures like say honor cultures where the term of prestige, you know, demand that you perform I don't know, a particular kind of tough self or whatever. And then there are, uh, there are cultures, many cultures, I would say, again, most cultures have strong victimhood components where you know, we venerate suffering, but our culture appears to, at least in some, um, in some dimensions, to once again, ascribe high levels of prestige to some sort of underdog uh, worthy, uh, you know, victim kind of status. When we start talking about the mental health crisis, incorporating some of these levels of analyses, we'll see we, we manage to ask very, very interesting questions. But before we go on a break, I'd love to hear some questions or comments or challenges, because I, I'm aware that I've, I've packed just a lot of stuff into a very dense hour. Yes. Some argument um, that goes both ways about uh, like the danger of the equal opportunity being a good thing, but then um, trying to ensure um, the equality of the outcome. Yeah. Happen. So I just found it to be a perception um, which is so determined by the process. I can't pronounce myself ethically, but I can say that um, equality of opportunity seems like the kind of noble goal that most human societies are happy to get behind. Um, and it seems increasingly just odd to justify that some classes of people for some reason just would not, would be denied opportunities based on what, on birth, on... But equality of outcomes is just, is just a complex. It's a cognitively difficult to even understand um, and so whether it's achievable and whether it ought to be achieved and who, there's a lot of debate about that, um, for sure. I suspect we'll revisit that conversation next week when we talk about, uh, sex and gender and when we talk about, uh, the women in STEM equity paradox, for example, where, um, there's an inverse correlation between gender equality and the number of women in STEM fields. So countries with low gender equality have more women in STEM than countries with high gender equality. So it, it, it's complicated. Um, but I would love to hear more thoughts. If someone has cracked it or solved it, yeah. In one sense, that if you're disincentivizing the condition by making sure everyone is the same, so is the contribution. I don't think anyone is saying everyone must end up with the same. You can't, as one person, be everything. You can't be a plumber, an astrophysicist, and the prime minister, you know, on the same day. So I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, well, no, just like in terms of if everyone meant that the you know, like inequality is up, and you can still the same resources. I mean, I'm assuming we're talking about. Yeah. I think that maybe it has also to do with power relations. So when we think of like systemic racism, systemic oppression, sexism, I feel like the idea of equality or like equal opportunity is not realistic and it's never going to be maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, probably. But addressing that is still mostly just working with ensuring that equal opportunities are there because it's true. 
that some people um, at baseline have many more opportunities than others, right? Some people have to, uh, for some people, it's a pretty easy race and, and others have to, you know, I don't know, run twice as much or three times as much for sure, for sure. Yes, oh, yes. Can you elaborate also to the, um, what you would consider to be a positive outcome um, for those structures of work with some pressures or whatever exposure structures that all the structures are part of? How can you be considered positive? Um, equal opportunity has to include an openness of the outcome can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure that outcomes have to be included in the way we imagine what we mean by, by equal opportunities. Uh, but you've, you've all heard, I think you're, you know, the, the typical conservative skepticism of equality of outcome is, um, I'm not sure what it is actually, but that it sounds, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I forget, I forget what it claims. I myself don't have a problem with it, but uh, but I understand that it causes some anxiety. Yes. Well, what does it mean exactly? I'm not really sure. Like, I was just thinking that because nobody has a rule in the United States, but is that not? Well, what I hope it doesn't mean uh, it's true, and, and I suppose that is one conservative fear. Um, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention my uh, my Nazi patients. Uh, contemporary Nazi theory, contemporary white nationalist theory also has uh, a racially representative equality of outcome uh, kind of picture. So for example, they say 2% Jews in societies, we can't have more than 2% Jews in universities. That's it. In fact, that used to be the case. Uh, it used to be the case for Jews until very recently in Canada. You know that some Ivy League universities have uh, inverse quotas for, quotas for Asians now. Right, they uh, they only accept a certain amount. So, it might sound like a good idea when you say, "Well, there are three percent uh, black Canadians, and and there ought to be at least three percent in universities or in the professorial body." That sounds great. But then, if you say, "Well, we need to have there needs to be a cap," so a good way to think about it is is of uh, what kind of floors and what kind of ceilings are we, are we thinking about? Like say providing a, a floor of equal footing, yes, but do we wanna provide a ceiling? And if so, what kind of ceiling? I myself would be very, very uncomfortable with the society in which we have to have representational ethnic matching in every sphere, everywhere. So, you know, whatever number of men, women, uh, non-binary, black, white, et cetera, has to be represented everywhere. That sounds really terrifying. but. I don't think at least the, like say the current new left uh, equality of outcomes, I don't think that's what they're proposing. That's, that's not what I'm hearing. Yes. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the highest achievers, but like they're the people who are most like self sufficient and have the most the biggest chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, that motivates them to perform well. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you're you know, towards the other extreme, like say the kids that grew up with rich parents, that gave them everything. And that's a little bit probably the extreme, <clears throat> but like, I don't know, I think it's some it's hard to strike a balance between wanting to give everyone equal opportunity and removing this one too. Sure, sure. It could also be if we if going off of similar like similar vein that in there's a certain level of 
a culture that hasn't met, that or is in the process of changing surrounding North America in terms of women entering into things such as STEM, where I can speak from, you know, the idea of there, even if the, uh, the, the moves are being made and there's, and there's movements are there into the idea of putting forward opportunities for education, opportunities for employment and whatnot, there still is a support that not, doesn't necessarily exist there. Whereas in a lot of people that have that motivation to uh, like climb a ladder or to become better, there is kind of like a push to do so and to uh, versus there's like a lack of um, a push for ambition in certain ways. Like I can speak on, uh, it was on like my family history in terms like it was expected for women to go to university until like my generation so that they could find a husband, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, and so even though that is, I think that's something that it seems very far away, but yet like my aunt was sent to university to go to get a husband, you know? And so it still is a present factor in a lot of people entering into the workforce at, you know, the level, the age above, you know, millennial and whatnot that exists. And so potentially that could also be a part in that um, people entering like that, the equality in a way, trying to move forward into it. It's kind of that there has to be like, the businesses in a way have changed to a certain degree but maybe the culture that's backing a lot of it is still left and needs to kind of, I don't want to say catch up, but there's still that process that's going on. I don't know. But, uh... You know, so briefly, women in STEM in countries with low gender equality and in fact, much lower human development index was an obvious class and economic factor, first of all. Um, so these are also societies in which many fewer people go to universities. So we're not looking at, you know, the kinds of women who go to university are typically from much, much more upper class background, not exclusively. These are also societies where um, as a function of particular conservative social values and economic opportunities, it's typically lawyer, doctor, engineer, or nothing. Even becoming a biomedical scientist is already, or then, you know, the lowest of the bunch will go to business school if you don't get into med school uh, or engineering school. Um, so these are societies in which there's not as broad and wide as your class. It's a society in which, you know, you can't just make a living out of, you know, writing blog posts for like some nonprofit and drinking lattes and riding a fixie bike when your parents pay your bills because, you know, that doesn't. So there's, there's that component. But the, the problems you mentioned about the tyranny of lower expectations or say more specific gender-based expectations for, for women that still exist in our societies and that existed more two, three generations ago. We can also assume exist much more in those societies when those women, where those women are actually more represented than here. So there's, there still lies a puzzle. Um, it also depends on our definition of STEM. I think if we were to include medicine, which in my view, we ought to, then the picture would be very different in, in North America, certainly in Canada, you know, it's been 50, 50 for a while and now 60, 40 in some places looking at 70, 40. So more the medical profession, but again, except for a few fields like surgery, radiology, anesthesiology. So you still have, are becoming feminized. So it's complicated, but we will get back to that next class, but what it, it's a particularly triggering kind of debate because what a lot of evolutionary minded scientists, including Sarah Hurdy, would say is that, well, actually, no, it's just that in the West, people are more free. There are more opportunities. So average differences in interest are more reflected. Uh, but many people don't like that. Many people still want you know, to uncover you know, their, their existing you know, oppressive structures or narratives or implicit bias you know, preventing. This is, this is where the debate is um, now in any case. But it's also interesting that on average, I think we could say that uh, fragility culture, not simply in the sense of people having more mental health problems or people appearing to be uh, more unwell, but in, in people elevating fragility and suffering as a sort of an end in itself also appears to be to a large extent uh, a, symptom of, a symptom of progress or a symptom of, of higher 
Um, and progress, not in the teleological sense of going from worse to better, but of going to having that which has changed more from the way things were. Uh, uh, and, and of course, by virtue of those, those uh, of course, very existing global hegemonic mechanisms where North American culture, European culture is assigned you know, high prestige and has high desirability and is or is imposed through media, whatever you want. This culture is of course spreading uh, to, to the rest of the world. Okay, I see that it's been uh, 